Okay, thank you for the kind words and the warm welcome. Before I start this talk, I wanted to say a couple of words about the context from which my viewpoint is shaped. I mean, there's a lot of subjective stuff in that presentation, and of course it might, might, might help you guys understand a little bit better the direction I'm coming from, because I assume that most of you or all of you work somewhere in the field of software development or have to do with the creation of software, but still that can be quite different, and sometimes people have very different points of view without realizing that they may be doing something quite differently. I've been working with ThoughtWorks for 12 years now. ThoughtWorks is a consulting company. We generally help other companies write software in a better way. We often help com companies become more agile. In some of my colleagues, Jess Humble and Dave Farley, wrote that book on continuous delivery, which was a realization that something was needed after finishing the initial writing of the software and getting the code into production, actually. So we have a lot of people. Martin Fowler works at ThoughtWorks, so he has been a big thinker, of course, in the whole field of software engineering. But we generally do that with our clients who are very, very different. And in general, we have about 80 or 90 projects going on at the same time across the world. We've, we're in 12 countries now. I get a lot of input from my colleagues or discuss a lot of projects with my colleagues, but most of them are really in the field of enter what, what people call enterprise software development. In-house application development, it can be large websites that are then publicly visible, but it is generally not product development, certainly not video games, not embedded software. So if some of the things I'm going to talk about make you think that's complete nonsense. Please bear that in mind that I might have a slightly different context. I think many, many things should be applicable though in general. So, I'm saying architecture without architects. Let's have a look at an architect. Interestingly enough, and I picked that picture on purpose, the architect is the guy on the right-hand side, the guy with suits. Normally, when you talk about software development, the guys in the suits are the customers or the managers, but the architects are normally the guys in jeans. So there's something funny going on here. Also, in the real world, the architects normally are the customer-facing ones. They are the ones who talk to the people who need that building or that bridge, but mostly buildings, and gather their needs. That's a role that in, in my world we often call business analyst, but not architect. Also interesting is their plans are incredibly detailed. Their plans are nothing like the typical architecture diagram we normally see, which comprises of 20 boxes connected by a few lines. These are really, really big plans, and I, I mean physically big too. What's also interesting when you look at those plans is the level of abstraction is really low. When they need, I can't count that quickly, when they need 10 windows across that facade, they have 10 windows in the plan. They don't use an abstraction like a for loop to say one window times 10 or something like that. So what you could argue if you compare what a real world architect deals with the level of detail of those plans, I would compare more to the source code we are writing. So if you think about what those architects and people who create these plans do, they are more like developers. And it's the part that comes after it, the construction phase in software, we've completely automated. No human involvement at all. But to think, because the architect draws a piece of paper, and then the developers come and code, and the coding is comparable to the building, I think that is a major, major flaw in people's understanding when they think about architecture. And I think the last thing that is interesting when looking at the architects, architecture is mostly concerned with the construction phase. There's a clearly defined construction phase. At some point, buildings are generally, I mean, for all intents and purposes, are finished and people move in and use them. And normally the architects are out of the picture. They don't generally get involved when the air condition needs to be redone. Buildings don't change as much as software either. I mean, today we often, at least when you look at internal, no, actually, when you look at internal applications and external applications, they continue to evolve over the years. They're not really finished. There's no construction phase, and then a 10 or 100 year, in cases of buildings, usage phase. It is all one, and they get extended, so the architects need to remain involved. But I think by using the metaphor of calling people architects in software, we're fooling ourselves into thinking about this. Oh, yeah, we just designed this up front, and then we build it, and we are done. And I think that's really also quite misleading. As you can tell, I don't like the metaphor. A while ago, I had a similar discussion, or well, actually it was a discussion with people, and we came up with the idea of saying, maybe what about town planning? Maybe look at that. Isn't that a bit better? Aren't we more like town planners? A city, and I think this is a plan of London, London wasn't planned two and a half thousand years ago to look like what it looks today. It evolved over time. 
there are certain rules. I mean, there are what they call conservation areas. There are areas with old houses, and you can't just build a new bungalow in the middle of it. There are even bigger rezoning or redistrict planning where people are saying, we want to redevelop this area that used to be light industry into residential. So there are some localized plans, but there are plans that can build on top of each other. There are localized rules that then allow this really large and complex environment to evolve over time, but also, crucially, to adapt to the changing needs, to adapt to how things changed. Maybe that road that looks like is this straight line here, and I, I've seen it when you look at older city plans, that re road used to go around the corner here, and this didn't exist because at that part, this part of the city wasn't built. But now it looks obvious as if it was always like that. So they really change and adapt. And you can also change backwards. That's another example from London. These are the so-called tower blocks. They were built if I know this correctly, after the Second World War to get people out of really bad housing. They weren't all too popular ever, and they're certainly not popular now. I'm not sure whether you can spot it down here. They're generally being torn down or even exploded these days. But the idea is they were a good time, uh, sorry, a good idea at their time. And I think in software, we have to have the same thing. We don't have to strive now to say, now I have the best plan for software for the next 10 years. If we have a good plan for the next two, three years, let's go with it. And if after two, three years, it turns out in two or three years' time, it isn't a good plan anymore or it isn't a good solution, that doesn't mean automatically it was a bad solution. This comes back to basically what people said in the Agile Manifesto, responding to change over following a plan. That is this idea. That's something that we have to be strong enough or confident enough to say, yeah, things have changed. What I said two years ago, strike it. What I said last month, it looked good last month. It's the wrong choice now. There's a really, really dangerous thing here that is known under the term the sunk cost fallacy. So the idea is, oh, we've spent so much money on that enterprise service bus, even though everything points at it being absolutely useless. You'll notice that I don't like enterprise service buses later on as well. Even though it's totally useless, we can't possibly get rid of it because we convinced the board three months ago to spend $10,000 or $100,000 on it. But you really, really need to be careful. When you know something has changed, it is secondary and even sometimes not necessary to find out whose fault it was. The most important thing is going forward is to do the best thing that you know at the point in time. Looking at the metaphors, I have one more for you. So we had the architect, we had the town planner that I think is a better match, and I have one more for you. And that's this one. I didn't come up with it. I spoke to somebody at BT, British Telecommunications. His title was actually, I think, chief architect or something like that. And he, at the time, also said he didn't like the title. And he said he felt more really like a gardener. He had, because I mean, he was an enterprise architect, so he was responsible for lots of individual software systems. And he said, yeah, every now and then, I plant a few new plants. The writing of software that we all and all the architects allegedly all focus on. But most of the time, I'm actually tending to the existing plants. And sometimes I need to look at them, give them a stern look, and sometimes weed them out and decommission some of the systems. And he said, provocatively, obviously, he said, I'd feel it would be better if I put chief gardener on my business card. It would be a better reflection, a better metaphor than chief architect. And when I, when I thought about it, when I, when I put up this picture and I look at, I've given this talk before, look at um, people's faces and I discuss this idea, many people find it humorous. And that got me to think and thought, and I'm thinking, did we choose architect, not even because we thought it was the best metaphor, but because it was something that we wanted to aspire to? I mean, in society, architects are generally well regarded. In general, they have a higher status than gardeners. I think I can get away with saying that. So did we choose that metaphor? Because it was vaguely matching, but it was associated with status. And we wanted to have that status and just said, no, I'm not a software developer. I'm not a coder. I'm an architect. I'm something that is really, really powerful. And we just didn't really care that it didn't match that much. It was close enough to give us a good name. I mean, I'm pragmatic enough. We're not going to change that. But what I'd want you to understand or take away, there's going to be four conclusions in this talk. Conclusion number one, architecture is a tricky, even dangerous metaphor. So don't forget this. I mean, I'm sometimes, as a consultant, sold as an architect. So I'm well aware of the irony. And some of you might carry the title architect in your organizations. Remember, it's a metaphor only. And it really, really sometimes misleads you into coming up with approaches 
that we really shouldn't think of in software that don't translate from the real architects. And by the way, in some countries, the real architects absolutely don't like that we use the term architect in software. I think in the UK, the Architect Association is actually trying to make it impossible to advertise jobs as architects because they also know that we don't use the metaphor very well. Okay. Switching gears slightly, I want to talk about evolutionary architecture. So we've, we are done with the architects. I'm talking about architecture now. And evolutionary architecture, can something complex really evolve? In a way, I assume most people here in the room kind of believe that evolution actually exists and worked. But it is still, it is still somewhat uncomfortable. At least I find this. I mean, I have a little son, and when we go to the zoo, and I see a chimpanzee, and I know that 97% of the chimpanzee's DNA is the same as my DNA. I'm like, okay, how did they do that? 3% from the chimpanzee to me? How did that just happen? Can something like that really, really happen? I mean, I think it is counterintuitive. We all know intellectually that that's the most likely way that everything evolved or it, it came into existence, but it's not really intuitive. And I think that's why we often struggle with these things. And as this guy here, it's actually not Charles Darwin, as you may have thought. It's a guy who lived, um, actually he lived later than Darwin, I think. Um, it's called Will, he's called William Palin. And he wanted to prove that God exists. And he came up with this idea, and he said, if you, whoops, if you walk along a country lane and you find this beautifully made watch, what is your assumption? That that just sprang into being? That all these little, I don't know, gears and everything, they just came together and came into being? No, there obviously must be a maker, somebody behind it, who made this. And then he said, of course, when you then think about human beings, they are so complex, they didn't spring into existence, so there must have been somebody behind it. And there he had his proof that God exists, because then obviously God had to make the human. I think he wasn't well trained in mathematics, because he would have realized that if God is even more complex, who made him? So he, I don't think he really, he really, really thought this through. But I do think it is really deeply ingrained in us that we have this feeling that if we encounter something complex, that we feel there must be somebody behind there, that this couldn't just have happened based on local rules, that it requires solid planning, it requires intellectual activity to come up with a strict plan to create something like that. And this is so ingrained, it is everywhere. And I, one example I'm taking here is from pop culture. Think about The Matrix. There is the architect in that movie. I mean, it is a very interesting movie, it, it, it makes us think about a lot of things, but in the end, there still is the architect in there. And again, there's this puppet master idea that if something is there, certainly there must be one instance, one entity that is controlling all of that, that is controlling the strings and holding everything together. I think it gives us humans comfort to have that thought that there is somebody in control, somebody who makes things happen. And that is, I think, why when we talk about software, we are often quite uncomfortable with thinking that software architecture can evolve without having an architect like him in the background. It is also interesting, though, if you look at it purely from a language perspective again, when you talk about real evolution, this is basically, if you try to pare it down a lot, this, these are the ingredients for evolution. So you get recombination of things, in um, the biological case, obviously the DNA, you do need some mutation, basically, to stop you from going too much into a local maximum to allow you to jump somewhere else. And you need a fitness function that compares and evaluates the individual attempts and selects them. That is not really what happens when we talk about architecture. I think in IT, there are two instances where you can actually see evolution at work. And on the one hand, it's open source software and with technology startups. So with open source software, you get people trying to solve the same problem. I mean, a classic example that I often use, it's a bit dated now, but if, and people have forgotten the other ones, but if you think about the Spring framework, there was also Pico Container and a number of others, and they were copy-pasting from each other. That was the whole idea about open source. And some pieces that were good stayed in, other pieces that weren't so good didn't stay in. They had a very clear fitness function here, because the success in the market, of course, was driven by how well suited this framework was to solve people's problem. And mutation generally happened when people had some crazy ideas late at night and, and changed things. We have similar ideas with technology startups. There's also a lot of technology startups that are trying ideas. A lot of people think, 
something that is successful, like say Facebook or Twitter, was successful solely because they had technical excellence and a great idea. I think these are necessary ingredients, but not sufficient. You also need luck. You need to be with the right idea at the right point in time. And for every Facebook that we see today, there were probably 50 others that were equally well thought out, had equally good software, and, or even better software. This is not to say that Facebook has bad software, by the way. Um, but at the same time, only one of them won. But what you also see with the technology startups is that people go from one startup to another to the point where some people call themselves serial entrepreneurs. They just go from one to the other, and there it's again the recombination of ideas, taking an idea from that business to another business. So that's really evolution in the sense of the biological evolution. That's not what we talk about. I went on to all this long excursus to just say, don't be too constrained about that metaphor either. With evolutionary architecture, we talk about just something that evolves, that changes over time. But how can you then see evolutionary architecture working well in software? How can you do that with larger teams? Hang on a sec. No, it's okay. How can you do that with larger teams? I think the only way to do that is to have some kind of vertical slicing. You know, in most software architecture diagrams, you get something like the user interface or an interface at the top and some data storage or external interface that provides the data at the bottom. And oftentimes, traditionally, you had layer teams. You had the DBA, the database team, you had the HTML, the UI developers, and you had the people who coded the business logic. That wasn't really very helpful. What we see nowadays a lot is that we have these feature teams. You have one team that works end-to-end, -end, which is similar to um, agile development, where you can actually do a story from end-to-end -end rather than saying, oh yeah, we can't deliver this until the database team has done all the database design, etc." And I think what this offers us is a really, really good way to experiment sometimes with trying one thing in one stream, in one slice, and another approach in another slice. So here you can again then see the evolution. You can try even to the point where sometimes people were saying, we can't make a decision. Should we use a relational database or should we use a NoSQL database? And I have seen it being done successfully where people really try it. They said, let's try on one stream one approach, on the other stream the other approach, and then actually compare our notes. Sometimes this is seen as being very wasteful because people are saying, why don't you make up your mind before? Because you're wasting all the effort of trying to do two things at the same time. I would hold against that saying, at least with that approach, it might be more costly, but at least I have a higher confidence that we make the right decision because at least they had to compete. They had to evolve. Whereas with the other approach, you make one decision and then you try everything in hindsight to justify that you made the right decision, but you've never really tried the other approach. But unfortunately, what the architects often do is they focus on this. They again see the abstraction. They want to go and, and see what is common to all of them. That's a very, very powerful thing that people want to do. And it is so powerful that I'm, I'm from Germany. We even have a word for it, one very long word. So people talk about these cross-functional requirements and all the things. And then they want to talk about this first and foremost. And suddenly, the architects focus only on this and they have gone back to the old way of working where you don't have the slices and you have again the layers and you get all the centralized problems that you often see. I'll come back to that later. So what I'm saying is this, it's not that that doesn't exist, but I think this really, really needs to go into the background. We need to focus on these and almost take it as Petri dishes, like little, take each of these slices as one little way of exploring ideas and evolving an overall architecture of the system. So basically, this is um, a definition of an architect transcribed from an email by Ralph Johnson on the XP list. And he said, the stuff that the expert developers find important to describe the system. So interesting enough, not architect, the expert developers. And I've extended a little bit. It's gradually changing over time. So I'm, I don't want these, yeah, yeah, we have done the system and now we're doing version two, which is basically a rewrite. It needs to be a gradual change over time. And it needs to go to the point where the origins are no longer discernible even. So this is again not like finishing it and then adding a few bells and whistles. The idea of evolving architecture is it can actually change quite dramatically over time. But what does that really mean? Where do you start with all of this? So there are three questions here. I mean, the first question I'm not even gonna 
attempt to answer because I think it's completely going in the wrong direction. I mean, why would you ask yourself, how much could I possibly do upfront? I want to come back to this. But what does upfront actually mean? A lot of times people talk about projects. But I mean, if, if in, in most organizations, projects are just a means to deliver systems. Sometimes systems are delivered over many different projects. So when you talk about upfront, do you mean upfront for the design of the entire system, upfront in each project? Or again, if you think at the big technology startups, what does upfront design in the context of Twitter mean? When they didn't know their business model, did they write or did they design a system that could scale to wherever they are now, to 500 million users? No, certainly not. Their design also evolved over time. And also, if you talk about upfront design, lots of things change all the time. There's mergers and acquisitions. And if you say, I designed this upfront, three months later, or everything has changed and your upfront is basically gone. So I think you should really think about this. How much upfront design is reasonable to do? And I'm a consultant, so I'll say there is no clear answer. And this is an example from a project that I was involved with a good while ago now. There was the website for the Guardian newspaper. And they basically did a complete rewrite of the website because they actually rightly so had realized that they were using a content management system for their website, but that was the most strategic asset in their entire organization and they felt they needed bespoke software. So we worked with them to create that website and we started with basically no architecture. We just, at the time, we said, let's use Spring, which was at version two at the time, and Hibernate. One design or architecture decision we made was to say, we don't want to use JSPs, we want templates without much logic. We, I think we used um, Velocity at the time, but that wasn't anything that you needed a true architect for. This was basically just common sense at the time to use that architecture. And we said, let's just build the system. And the system grew over time, and we knew we were heading for a big monolith, and we knew that was actually a bad idea. A monolithic application wasn't the right solution for the Guardian. But we still did it because we could iterate very quickly over time. If we had done all the slices, we would have to talk about interfaces. Here we could just change the Java code. It was all neatly loading into the IDE as one project. You could make refactorings and you could adapt. At some point, we obviously got, and I remember it was around um, school league tables and eco diets. You know, like there was a there was a journalist who said, I need some extra functionality. And the developer said, okay, I can do that in a couple of hours. And he said, oh, that's great. So I can put it on the website tomorrow. And I said, no, no, no. You know, when we add functionality, it needs to go into the performance testing and it needs to run 48 hours under extremely high load over the weekend to prove that it is actually a good change. And the journalist said, look, if I get a visitor a minute, I'm happy. I don't need performance testing for hundreds of visitors per second. So clearly the the requirements for the different parts of the website were diverging. And at that point, we started splitting out these so-called micro-applications. And then over the long term, the idea obviously was to get to a point where we have these slices, these individual applications. But here, the upfront design that we did was actually almost non-existent and we evolved to it and we still feel it's the right choice because we could go so quickly in the beginning by having everything under control. But I have a counterexample. An organization in Germany, they are actually, I think, the second largest e-commerce company in the world. And they also decided that the package that they were using for the e-commerce side wasn't the right thing to use because it was a strategic asset. But they make about 2 billion euros revenue with that website. No, actually, no, 80% of 2 billion, but it's still a huge number. And that was a package software. And they again said, no, this is so strategic to us. Again, we need to ditch the package. We need to have bespoke software to power our e-commerce side. And they went immediately with this model and said, no, we do want vertical slices. We will start with a large team. There's some time pressure. We want to get this project done relatively quickly. And as much as people criticized or as we contemplated whether we did the right thing with the monolith here because we knew we would have to split it later, here we were contemplating, was it really the right thing to start with the split initially because we made some small changes and they were spanning all these slices and sometimes you had to call from one to the other, something we later realized was actually a bad idea, but it was much, much harder to get anything done with the right architecture from the start. And interestingly enough, that also grew. And then at some point, this slice got so big that it got split again. So even though we said we start with the right architecture, we do a lot of upfront design, even though we had to adapt it later on as well. But I do think in that case, it may actually have made sense because it was such a large team. If you had 40 developers working on a single monolithic application, I think that would have ended trying this approach 
that would probably have ended in tears as well. What I'm trying to say here is architecture is mostly or exclusively an ongoing activity. Architecture is not the one thing that you do up front and then the architect moves on and gives it to the developers. Okay, what do architects do? Or what, what world do they live in? There's one thing, and I alluded to it earlier, there is this seductive power of abstractions. In software, in general as humans, I think, we really like abstractions. And one of the things that I've often seen senior developers and architects do is to write common infrastructure frameworks. Before the new application is being written, the architecture team, or sometimes people are even as, I don't know whether I should say arrogant or confident, but they're saying the good developers will write the framework and the not so good developers will then use the framework. But we do a common framework. But even if they don't do that and they use an external framework, these frameworks, while they're helpful, I'm not saying they're not helpful, they don't mean that you can have a two-class society. You need to understand what is going on under the abstraction. And I'll give you two examples for that. This is an example from that, um, from, a, from, a, from a project that I was actually on, and it's in the world of object relational mappers. And think about an application like, um, like Flickr, where you have images that have tags. So an image could be tagged with Öresund Bridge or Malmö and so on. And there was a user story that was to be implemented in the admin application. And the function was, show me all the tags that are not being used. Because I mean then the tags shouldn't be in the system or you should wonder why did somebody create that tag and should maybe other things be tagged with this. That was the story. And this was the code that was being written. I hope you can all, this is pseudo code, I hope you can all follow it. So it's a loop over all the tags. So all tags is a collection that has them all. And I'm iterating over all the tags, and then it says tags.images.count equals zero. So if there are no images on the tag, then I'm adding that tag to the unused tag collection. And it works fine. The code is functionally absolutely correct. The interesting thing was it didn't work in production. And the reason being here is this is using an object relational mapper. So what's happening here is there's a tag like Malmö or Sweden dot images. The object relation mapper now says, oh, let me get all the images that are tagged with Sweden. Brings them into memory. Then it counts, oh, there's a few hundred thousand on them. It's not zero, never mind, let's move on to the next. So it, when that loop executes, it actually loads all the images into main memory. But the point is, what you often see when architects talk about this, they say, oh, the architects, they have the experience, they can select the framework, and then the developers don't have to know all the complicated stuff. They can just work on that abstraction level. And I really, really think this is not true. You cannot go that way. Maybe the architects, and I come back to that, what they can do later, they can have a role with those frameworks, but certainly not the role of I select and somebody else uses and doesn't need to know. I mean, that doesn't mean I wouldn't use an OIM. It's actually, a, it's nicer to be able to write code like that when it makes sense, but you can't say, I don't need to know what's happening beneath. And there's another example from the real world. This was from a trading system. So quotes here are a quote for a trade in, in the financial services world. And there was a common in-house written infrastructure framework where you could just say send message. So send a message to another trading system. That is the name of the queue that it's sent on and quote message is a nice Java class that you can put stuff into and that is then being sent. And you don't have to worry about anything. It's all done in the framework. And there's, there's a few layers of abstraction underneath here. And in the end, it ends up in the kernel network stack and something happens here. All the software abstractions meet the real world and on the hardware level, you get this thing, the MTU, the maximum transfer unit, which is as much data as you can put into one packet on the network. This was all UDP based, so no connection concept. And if it goes over 1,500 bytes, then it splits into two packets and you get all sorts of issues with reordering and resequencing. So you just add an instance variable here, which pushes the serialized version of this message over this magic number all the way down here and something really bad happens. So again, just to say you don't have to know about what's underneath in the abstraction layers here was a clear problem. But sometimes you don't even want to do it. And this again is another example. This is an application we wrote, as actually visible here, um, for Nokia. And it was an API 
a JSON API that allows you to access place information. So Foo Cafe is probably in there and you can get like what the category is and opening hours, address and so on. And this was a project in 2011, so we were all doing JSON and RESTful and almost by the book, the design. We wanted to anyway. So as you can probably see here, there is no um, URL templating. So this is the result of a search around these coordinates, these geo coordinates. And the results array is an, yeah, an array of items. And you can see this is at that position. It's called the last cathedral. It's 194 meters away. And you can see here the href allows me to actually go directly to more information about that place. But more information is the key. If we had done it by the book, this is good. All the rest people like that. Hypermedia, you get a type, you can follow a link. This is nice and generic. But what happened here is we put the distance in here, which I mean, how stupid is that? It's redundant because you can actually make the calculation yourself. But on the other hand, people wanted to, we wanted people to use the API and it's much, much easier. It's actually not totally trivial. Most of the time you Google the formula of how to do the um, distance calculation. But we didn't want everybody who used the API to have to do it, so we included it. And similarly, we included the name. We included the category even of that, even though that is completely against the idea of hypermedia. Hypermedia would have just returned an array nicely with only the type of the item and a link to go further. Why didn't we do that? Because even though as architects we understood REST and we knew why it was some good design, what really was important was this, the applications that we were going to write with it. And now think about it, if you write a maps application like this and you use pure REST and hypermedia, you do one query which gives you all the results and then just to display, to decide whether you want to draw here a little fork and knife or whatever that sprocket thing here means, but you know, like to make the icons, you would then have to make another request to say, oh, hypermedia, I see you are a type of place, let me grab the information and then parse it. So to do this, you would have had a lot of requests going on. Whereas in the way we designed it, a map application that was clearly targeted for the API could do with one request. May, I, I can't remember now whether we later on also inlined even the, um, the average user rating so that you could pop that up quickly. The other thing that we noticed was it is actually worthwhile to test mobile application on mobile networks. It might sound obvious, but I mean, it's very tempting when you're in the office to actually have the phone next to the computer and use a Wi-Fi network. But it turned out, I'm not sure whether that's still the case or whether it was an absolute anomaly, but it turned out up to a certain amount of kilobytes, it didn't matter how many kilobytes you transmitted, the latency, the time that passed between making the request and all the bytes being on the phone were roughly the same. So we realized there was absolutely no penalty in the real world to actually inline more information about the items. And we did that to make the application perform better, to give better experience to the users, even though we knew that from a pure architecture perspective, that was absolutely the wrong thing and we were violating a couple of principles of good REST design. So, common infrastructure frameworks clean and correct architectures, be wary of them. I mean, there's no, it, it's good to know these things and it's good to use them when they make sense, but they are not the end goal. The end goal, you need to know your abstractions and then that's the term, if you want to Google it further, uh, mechanical sympathy to understand what is actually going on under the hood and what impact does that have on my software. There's a fantastic talk by Martin Thompson who was actually involved in writing a trading system from scratch and they found out to write absolutely high-performance Java for that, they had to know the CPU caches, of, like the size of the CPU cache of the Intel CPUs in their servers to actually get the best performance. And in Java, we are being told you don't need to know assembler. You can just write Java code and don't worry about all the rest. And those guys not only needed to understand how an Intel CPU worked, they needed to know how big the caches were and how those cache lines, they are called, and how the caching strategy in the CPU worked to get the performance out of the Java application that they needed. And that's the idea of mechanical sympathy, to show some sympathy as the software developer to the mechanics and the underlying pieces that your software is working on. There's many examples of that. And the other one is, if you have people that make decisions, and maybe they shouldn't make the decisions, but let's assume they make them, 
at least make sure they have to live with the consequences. Because otherwise, you get this thing of the ivory tower where people make the right decisions, and most of the architects that the developers don't like actually are not malicious. They don't want to make the life for the developers harder. They really truly believe they made the right decision. It is just that they never see and never live with the consequences that they don't understand the problem with their decisions. And I think it's quite crucial. I'm not sure how clearly that comes across when you translate it back to Swedish. There's a big difference in English to be aware of the consequences and to live with the consequences. And I think, I mean, to take a more drastic example, we are all, I assume, aware of poverty, of poverty in third world countries. I've not done it myself, but I have met people who lived in places like that, and they came out quite, quite different. Just thinking, I, I know what's going to happen, is one thing, but really living with it is a very, very different thing. And the problem with architects that don't code is that they never live with the consequences. They will always tell you that they're aware of the consequences, but I don't think that that is enough, actually. And that's a really nice example. This was also from a real project, which must remain unnamed. They had this front end, and they had back end services. So detail here, this was an application that provided Interesting enough, also point of interest data, like um, cinemas and, and cafes and so on. So the front end was a web application, and that could provide or could get access to the detail through an ESB. The thinking here, when we spoke to the architects, was, yeah, we see some monetization strategies, and we can actually make the information not only available on our front end, but we can probably sell it to third parties, and we are thinking about some deals already, and if it's on an ESB, we can just plug in all the other consumers of this. And it's all going to be fantastic, and we can have this monetization strategy quite quickly. And for them, the ESB was really just that line. And I mean, what's the harm of a single little line? It's actually a great thing, because you can plug other things in. But that's only really true in the world of the architect and that diagram. When we talked to the developers, they were really complaining they couldn't get anything done because of the ESB. And what we did then is we did some analysis and looked at a different way of presenting the ESB, and that's what we came up with. So here's the front-end application. So there's an action, it was a struts application. Then there's this content service, which makes a request to um, Crossfire. Is it Crossfire? Celtics? Yeah. It's uh, basically in a web services um, framework. But what happened here, so they want to get the point of interest information for an ID, like for the, the ID for, of Fu Cafe is whatever, they know it for some reason, now they want to get the information. So they wrap this in this purple Java object. That framework sends it over the wire, so it's wrapped into an XML message, which is wrapped into a SOAP message. Then Mule, the ESB, and this is not to say that Mule is a bad product, there's a long discussion, I actually blogged about this, it's in this instance, it wasn't used correctly and wasn't needed. So Mule takes the message, wraps it into an opaque Java object, it's still only the ID, gives it to this class that was implemented by the developers that is called WS to REST handler, which basically wraps it into an XML message. Then you get the REST server wrapper impl, which puts the XML message into a Mule message object. It's still only the ID, sends it to Mule, Mule takes it out of the Mule message object, which is only the API that uh, Mule uses, and takes the XML message and puts it into an HTTP POST request. So nothing has changed at all going down here. It's just wrapping and unwrapping, and there's lots of code being written to take one format, wrap it, and put it from one format into the other. The same thing, incidentally, happens on the way back. Uh, neatly, there's actually a little asymmetry in here, where at some point, yeah, here you see the XML message is passed down, but an object comes back. But again, just for simplicity's sake, the address and phone number, the real information doesn't get touched at all. The only thing that all the code does is wrapping and unwrapping. And this is the ESB in the middle that used to be that innocent line. It doesn't add any value here, there's, there's nothing there. And what, when you think about it, it bears a certain resemblance to science fiction films. And for that reason, this is called the wormhole pattern. So it's like these wormholes that go from one end of the universe to the other. Because there's one end of the universe that has the ID, and the same idea pops out, sorry, same ID pops out down here, and goes through this wormhole of transformations. And interestingly enough, another reason, or another interesting aspect of this project is worth bringing up here is oftentimes, and again in that project, the ESB was sold as a decoupling layer, so that you could change one side, you could change this thing here without necessarily always changing that. But what happened was, because 
Ultimately, this was such specialized coding, there was a team that was implementing all the code in the ESB, another team here, basically they had an API here, and both of them started writing anti-corruption layers, because they said, oh, no, no, we need to be able to talk to that version of the ESB implementation and that version because we don't roll out at the same time. So rather than that being the anti-corruption layer, it created three more anti-corruption layers because it became a software component in the middle. But the architects who only saw it that way, they didn't realize that. They didn't live through this. They didn't write all that code. They just thought, it's a good thing to have the ESB. It's just the line. What could be wrong with the line? Oops, this should disappear. And the other thing is Conway's law. What you also get, especially with architect groups where the architects are centrally located. Do you know Conway's law? It's basically the idea that says the software that is being written will resemble the structure of the team that is writing it. It's actually quite old, and at the time people made the example of a compiler, and they said if I ask two, uh, sorry, a group of people that are organized as, as two sub-teams to write a compiler, they will write a two-pass compiler. If I before split them into three sub-teams, they will write a three-pass compiler. There are good reasons to write a two-pass or three-pass compiler, but generally the, the choice is made by the team structure. And we see the same thing of Conway's law at that architectural level. And when we have centralized enterprise architects, you generally end up with enterprise architecture that has centralized components. And that usually are ESBs or business process modeling engines or execution engines, all these things, because the architects realize there's just too much software. They can't control all of that, but they sit in the middle, so they create some software that runs in the middle. Or actually, they buy some software because they can't write it, and they think it's cheaper to buy it anyway. So you get all these centralized things. So we see Conway's law again. And again, people often don't live with the consequences here either. Oops. So what I've hopefully shown you is that architecture and development can't really be separated. You can't really say somebody is an architect and somebody else is a developer. It's the same activity. But if we believe that, what do architects actually do? Or what artifacts do we have in software development. We have design diagrams and models. But I mean, if we are saying we don't do design upfront, then design diagrams are only documenting what has been implemented. So is the architect now the guy who writes the documentation? A scribe? I don't think so. Then there are patterns. But I don't think patterns are generally designed by people on a project. It is good for software developers to know patterns and know when they apply. But there is not an architect that says, on this project, we're going to use the visitor pattern and, I don't know, the lightweight flyway pattern and all these things. They generally actually are done in the course of development. And even if there's a new pattern, should a new pattern evolve, it is just evolving in the project and you just have to spot it, basically. So pretty much not much left for an architect to do. We also talked about frameworks already. I don't think an architect or an architecture group should write the frameworks for the development team for various reasons. So, next two things are code and tests. Yes, architects absolutely should write code. I believe that very, very strongly, but that now doesn't set them apart from developers, so we're struggling again. Tests, yes, of course, I'm a big proponent of test-driven development, so you should write tests and code at the same time. Again, I would hope that architects who write code write tests, but we wouldn't want them to write only tests. I think that would be a very crazy idea for architects to say, I write the tests and the developers implement them and make them green. I I can't see a world in which that would work. So basically, yes, absolutely, architects should do that, but that's also what the developers do, so it's quite hard to define what else they can do. And then there are these things that I think the whole team should work on that maybe architects could otherwise do. Guidelines and principles, and what I mean by that are things like, oops, composition of inheritance, to say, okay, in general on this project, when we come into a situation where we generally use composition and not inheritance. Or there are other examples. These are all real examples that we have done on projects. This is an interesting one. There was a system that had an anemic domain model, a domain model where the data was in one set of classes and the logic was in another set of classes. And they used inheritance in the model. So the classes that contained the logic often did instance of to find out which class it is. It's not good. I saw you frown. Of course, but the rule we had, rather than saying, oh, the architect on the weekend takes out all the instance off, or the architect is to blame that they got in there in the first place, the point here was to say, 
when you add a new instance of, an old one must be removed. At least we're not making the code base worse. Uh, sorry, worse. There was the idea at some point to say, when you add a new instance of, you have to remove two to kind of really make people think quite hard of not adding more. But I mean, it was impossible to not sometimes add a new instance of given the software structure. There's always 350,000 lines of code in that software system. But these principles really evolved from discussions of the team, of what the team wanted to do. And the other one, visualizations. I'm going to show you an example. That is the architecture diagram for the system I talked about, the 350,000 lines of code. But this was not created by the architect. This was created by a piece of software. And the good thing is the software does not lie. It shows you what the architecture really looks like. So this is an architecture diagram with the layering. The software automatically deduces the most likely layering, looking at the dependencies. And you can see with the blue arrows how they depend on each other. And most, if you zoom in on this, you see that most of them actually go down, but some of them also go up. But this is the complex web of dependencies that is the real architecture. And I really like these visualizations because they show you what your software really looks like. You don't have to do an architecture diagram up front. You don't have to write one because you would kind of we all want to have nice architecture, so we would abstract away, or we would find a way to represent this without all the blue lines. And that's actually, this is, a, this is another example from a real project. These are only the beans from the spring contexts and their dependencies. So the gray boxes, I don't know how many of you know spring, but it's just a Java framework that maintains or manages components. So these gray things are the contexts, and in there are the beans, and again, the lines are the dependencies between them. You can immediately spot some patterns here. There's all these that are siblings, and they all depend on, or they have a dependency on this one thing here. You can also see there's something going on between those guys and these, namely a very complex set of dependencies, but also here seems to be some layering. The actual architecture diagram for this one looked like this. So we have the data access objects at the bottom. We have the business objects that work with the data objects. We have the view and controller that works with the business objects. And security is spanning those two layers. Interesting enough, this is also in this diagram. This is the data access objects. These are all the data access objects. And that's actually the Hibernate session factory that allows them to get a database connection. Here, we have the business objects. And the business objects indeed do depend on the database objects. And they have some layering in them. And here, we get the servlets which are the views and controllers, and they depend. And this is the context that does security, and you can see, yes, it actually depends on some of the servlets and some of the other stuff. But again, this might be useful for when a new person joins the project. But to actually work with the system, you're really fooling yourself, I think, if you say, this is our architecture. That is your architecture. And the big problem is, I don't think any developer or architect can claim that they intuitively understand this web of dependencies, and it actually makes sense to them. <coughs> there are even nicer tools, like this thing called Code City that shows you the classes are the black buildings here, and it, this is one way of showing dependencies. This is a package here that shows the outbound dependencies. So there are really, really good ways of looking at your software. Better than drawing an architecture diagram. So what I would say, conclusion number four, the last conclusion, most of what architects have done traditionally should be done by the developers, it should be done by tools, or it shouldn't be done at all. Where does that leave you if you have architect in your job title, like myself? What is the value of an architect? My colleague Martin Fowler had a really nice quote from an article about five or six years ago, and he said, an architect's value is inversely proportional to the number of decisions he or she makes. I've extended that a little bit. I'm not as good as Martin, but I think it's important to add this. It's also inversely proportional to the number of diagrams and frameworks he or she creates. So again, where does that leave us? I think it leaves you here, the architect as a guide. I think you can have people who are on paper architects, but their role is more like that guide person in this picture here. So what does he do? He doesn't carry the other people. Let's call them a team. He doesn't carry the other team members across that river. He doesn't go upriver and stop the river so they can safely go across, like sometimes the architects, some architects talk about themselves being the parents and the developers, the kids, and doing all sorts of things so the developers don't hurt themselves. So he certainly, 
he's certainly not going up the river and stopping it so they can go across. He's also not going up the tree. I assume they're looking at a bird or an animal. He's certainly not going to climb up the tree, grab the animal, and give it to those people in his team. The only thing he knows, he knows the area. He knows where to go around, and he probably knows a good spot where to find the animals, and then he points the other people at it. So he's guiding them through it. And I think that that is what architects should do. Some of you may know Dan North. He talks about irreversibility. So sometimes you make decisions that are really, really hard to reverse. I think architects can really help as the people with more experience to avoid the irreversibility. So when the team is about to go down to a path that the architect, the experienced developers, has gone through several times, that they can say, hey, it's an interesting idea. I thought the same thing five years ago. And then that happened. Did you consider that? And then maybe the developer say, yeah, actually, no, I didn't consider that. Thank you. So there's this thing that has become, no, I'm how I get that even worse. So there's, there's this, the, the Donald Rumsfeld idea of the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. So there are certain things that we know we don't know. I know I don't know Finnish. But there are things, the unknown unknowns, there are things that we don't even know that we don't know them. These are all the problems that will occur. And I think that's the same phase as irreversibility. What the architects can really do as the experienced developers, they can know what the unknown unknowns are and help the team. They don't have to say, I, as the most experienced person, design the database schema. They can look over the database schema and say, hey, did you consider when you do this, the clustered index will not work because Oracle does these funny things in the statistics mode. And people say, oh no, but thank you for telling me. I can look into this now and I can come up with a different design. So the idea again is to use the experience that people have to actually guide other people rather than direct them or create a plan for people to follow. And that's all I had. Thank you.